Hello everyone, it's Tina Ramirez, and I am very excited to introduce my good friend, Victor Conde, to you today. Uh, Victor also goes by the name Skip, so I, I hope you don't mind, Skip, I'm just gonna refer to you as, our, as your name uh, during the interview, but so Mr. Conde, Skip, is such a good friend of mine, somebody that actually taught me human rights over 20 years ago uh, when I studied at the International Institute for Human Rights in Strasbourg, France. That was, I think, 1999. So uh, we've known each other for 22 years now, and uh, it, Skip has come on to uh, not only um, do all of the great things that he's done in his career, but but he's a huge part of Hardwired and our legal trainings around the world. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but just as a little bit more background, uh, Professor Conde has been a professor of international human rights in many universities around the world. Uh, one, the place that we met was at the International Institute for Human Rights in Strasbourg, France, which he'll talk about. He is the author of several books. Uh, the, the one that I first met him when he was working on was a handbook of international human rights terminology, which is really such an important piece of work in the field of human rights because very few people go back and say, well, what did the law or those words actually mean, what were they intended to mean versus what do I want them, what do I think that they are? Uh, and then he was also the co-author of Human Rights and the United States, a, um, a, an encyclopedia essentially of human rights in the United States. And I had an opportunity to work with him on the second and third edition of that encyclopedia as well and contribute to it, which was an honor for me. But Professor Conde has trained many leaders in human rights around the world. Every summer he teaches at the Institute for Human Rights uh, course, both in French and in English on terminology so that every new uh, generation of, of young people that goes through the, through the Institute really is embedded with this understanding of what is the foundation of human rights? What is, what is the, uh, the terminology? What does it mean so that we don't go off track? So that's uh, this, just a brief introduction. I'm sure I went a little all over the place, but Skip, thank you for being with us today and for, for joining me and for all the work that you've done with Hardwired over the years. It's an honor and a pleasure. I'm excited. So, uh, well, we should probably share. So after, after meeting Skip at Strasbourg, I was inspired to work in the field of human rights. And I thought maybe it would be good for you to share a little bit about, about what we did with that and what happened. I ended up becoming a teacher and doing a study in my class on the impact of teaching human rights in the classroom. And it was, it was just an amazing opportunity. You came in, it was actually the year that there was a school shooting in Santee, San Diego. And you were able to teach my students about the power of words and of the meaning of human rights and of words. Do you, do you remember that? And the impact of seeing what happened with my students? If you gave me the test on what, what I taught that year, I'd probably flunk it. But uh, I, 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 I'm always concerned about people who, who misunderstand things. They hear one or two words or see one image, and they, they come to a conclusion about what something is, and it's really not correct or fully correct. And so I'm concerned about people understanding the meaning of words. For example, torture. What does that mean? Genocide. What does that mean? They all have specific meanings. And so in my classes, I usually start out with terminology, the meaning of words, so that when we read a text, a document about human rights, what they are, we'll understand the meaning of those words and we'll grasp the correct meaning of what this document is about, like the rights of women, the rights of refugees, the rights of disabled persons. So it's about understanding comprehending the language because this language is translated into all sorts of different other languages in the world and we need to have a common understanding as close as we can to the meaning of these texts these texts of human rights because the texts of human rights say what the government can do and what it can't do so we want to know what what what's correct about those instruments so what did we do with those uh tina went to school and she um did, finished her bachelor's and then she did her master's and she did it in education and she taught um, uh, she taught a course down in, in uh, Orange County to eighth graders and one time she invited me to come and talk to her students and I came and talked to her students there were two classes of I think 30 students each and and I remember asking one of the one, the students I, I have an I, I have an example here would you tell me whether you think this is a human rights violation 
a young girl that's going down the street and the policeman sees her and he goes up to her and he says, I hate you because you're a Jew, get out of this neighborhood, and he beats her up with his baton. Do you think that would be a human rights violation? Now, this is eighth grade or so. Anyway, and a girl in the second row, she raised her hand and she said, Professor, uh, that would violate Article 5 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which prohibits torture, cruel, unusual, degrading treatment and punishment. And I just about fell over. Uh, this is what Tina had taught this girl about how to recognize real world events in terms of human rights terminology and human rights laws. That you can't torture, you can't cruel or unjustly or un inhumanly treat another human being because they have human dignity. So that was a great lesson for me to see what human rights education did and what Tina, my student, had done. And as a teacher, uh, these are the joys and the rewards of teaching when you see your students doing this kind of thing and transmitting what you've taught them to the coming generations. I was terribly uh, honored that Tina had, had taught so well uh, as part of her master's degree class. Also, these students created a little organization. They had, they had like a, a uh, they had pro-abortion organization, they had anti-abortion, pro-capital punishment, anti-capital punishment, refugees, women's rights, all sorts of different organizations and children's rights. And they set up an organization, they had a motto, they had a song, they had a, uh, a logo, and they, they, they told us about their organizations and it was brilliant. These are eighth graders and I was really impressed. So. It showed me the value and the, the effectiveness of human rights education done right and how we can transform young minds to, to think consistent with human rights, which the United States has largely accepted in the international community and which the, the United States was largely responsible for creating. So from there, I mean, the next thing I remember, Kina, I was meeting her in the United Nations in, the, in uh, Geneva. And uh, we were talking to a Catholic Archbishop about, you know, how we could help him uh, become more effective in the Human Rights Committee or Human Rights Council. And also, uh, I remember Tina had to give a presentation at the UN Human Rights Council one time, and I helped her prepare for that. And I was just so proud when she got up there in front of all these representatives of these countries and talked about her position about all the human rights violators who were in this council. The council was a council that had a whole lot of countries that are violating human rights. So it was kind of about that hypocrisy. But she had the gall and the courage to stand up and tell these dignitaries, these ambassadors, these high level people, you're not doing things the right way. You're not doing things consistent with human rights. And it really, it, it was just so impressive. I, I, uh, that's what courage does, and that's what a proper training does. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach people what are human rights. For me as a Christian, I want to teach what are human rights consistent with what I believe as a Christian. It's not all things that all people say are human rights. I don't believe they're all human rights. But I've got a lot of experience and knowledge and study of learning what are the human rights and what are not human rights. So I tend to help people try to see what is right and correct and what is not. And other people will differ with me, and I accept that too, okay? Well, it was, I mean, you were an inspiration to me, Skip, back, uh, you know, at the, at the Institute. And the Institute was a really special place because coming to it, I was, I think, 19 at the time. Uh, I didn't really have any framework for human rights other than, you know, this this UN system that just seemed to constantly trample on the freedoms of people I knew and loved. And so I didn't really understand it. And it was really eye opening for me to go there and to meet people that were suffering for their, their faith. Uh, we met a man from Rwanda that escaped the Rwandan genocide. Uh, and I, I remember one of the, the after sessions that we did, and many others, but to learn from you how you had spent your career using this field of international human rights law 
to advance the dignity and protection of people that were being persecuted or that were suffering for their faith or their background. And you've worked in a number of areas of human rights. You're a refugee and asylum lawyer, you know, by day, uh, so that, you know, you, you, you can get you can get paid, but then you also have been on the board of, of human rights education at Amnesty International. You've done, done so many things. And so I wanna go back to the Institute. So the Institute is, is a very unique place. Can you tell me how it got started? Well, why Strasbourg? Is, why, why did we, I mean, why an institute there on human rights? Why is it important? Strasbourg, which is now called the capital of human rights in, uh, in Europe, and probably in the world. Uh, in 1968, a man named René Cassin, who was a French lawyer, um, he uh, was working in the UN with, along with Eleanor Roosevelt and Charles Malik and some other people. And they tried to create a document that would say, what are human rights for the whole, everyone in the whole world? And they created a document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I advise all of you to read it. It'll take about 15 minutes. But that document um, won René Cassin the Nobel Peace Prize in 1968. And he took the money from the Peace Prize. When you win the prize, you get some money too. And he took the money to set up a, a learning institute for, for people from all over the world so they could learn what human rights are. Now, René Cassin was a French Jew, and he uh, was very close to the Holocaust and many people uh, who were involved in the, in the Shoah. And so it touched him so profoundly that he wanted to make sure that this document would protect human beings from that ever happening again. Unfortunately, that has not been the case. But Rene Kassam started the, the International Institute of Human Rights, which brought together uh, 200 to 300 lawyers and, and, and pastors and uh, uh, poli-sci professors, judges, uh, police chiefs, military leaders, uh, law students who want to learn what are human rights and what are the different areas of human rights? What's the latest in human rights? For example, in protection of data uh, or protection of refugees or protection of women, um, uh, protection against torture, human rights education. All of these things are the topics that the Institute teaches. They give you the basics of human rights, like all of the ABCs, and then every year they have a theme, like one year it'll be protection of internet, for example, uh, or protection of, uh, uh, of women. Uh, and so every year there's a theme and, and, and people come, some just for the theme, but others and mostly to learn all about the latest things in human rights, because in their countries that they come from, they can't learn this stuff. And it is the premier learning institute of human rights in the whole world. Uh, there are academic programs in human rights, like an LLM program, but those are in law school. Those are very specialized. But people from all over the world come to Strasbourg every summer, uh, except for this last summer because of COVID, to learn human rights. And then they go back to their countries and they put that into their countries. If you looked at all of the leaders in the top five people in every country of the world, you'd find people who had been to the Institute in every one of those countries. Because what it does to these people that go there is it it, it motivates you, it activates you, like it did to me. I went to the Institute in 1983, 84, and it turned me on to this field of human rights, which I felt was God's calling on my life. And that's why I got into it so deeply. So tell me then, just to go straight into that, what really inspired you to, to be involved in the human rights field and, and particularly related to refugee and asylum and religious freedom? Because those are really two of the areas you've dedicated so much of your life to? Well, when I was in high school, I had a, a teacher, uh, a Jesuit priest who used to talk about Christians behind the Iron Curtain in communist countries that, that got persecuted for their faith. And it touched me very deeply. I said, this is not right. There's just something not right about that. They should be free to practice their religion. So all through the rest of my life, I have tried to work for religious freedom, knowing that Christians are persecuted everywhere. Other religions are getting persecuted too. And even in some places, Christians are persecuting other people. That happens. But I, the, the idea of religious persecution, of people stopping people from believing what they will and uh, doing violence about it, that really touched me when I see that happening. So I, when I was in college, I went and took a trip to Eastern Europe. I was like 21. 
and I visited these countries, these communist countries, and I saw there was no churches open. And in Russia and Moscow, I actually saw a church that was open, and it was full of old women and a couple little children. The men didn't dare go there, but religion was formally prohibited, and you were really uh, persecuted if you went to church. So I saw the persecuted church firsthand, and I wanted to do something to help them out. So I dedicated the rest of my life to working at some level in my life to, to doing that. So I felt God's calling on my life to protect uh, people's right to practice their religion as they will, because it's part of, it, it is a human right. To practice your religion is a human right. It's recognized in the international law as a human right, but the right is violated all the time in most countries of the world in some way. So I'm working to make sure that human beings, all human beings, regardless of their religion or their politics or their country, they all are free to express their religious feelings and to express their other ideas, political, social, et cetera, cultural. Uh, they can express those freely because that's part of our human dignity. So I felt motivated by God as a Christian. Uh, every person that I see, I, Jesus reminds me, that person is made in the image and likeness of God in their humanity. I have a view about salvation and how to get to heaven and all those kind of things. It's different from many others. But in the makeup and the nature of human beings, they're all made in the image and likeness of God. And I try to make them see that. And as I go and I do my work in human rights to help them become free in their societies, I hope that they will see Jesus in me and be drawn to Jesus because that's what my job is to do, to lead people to God. And in all the human rights work I do, it's not just to create justice and peace and freedom, but it's to bring people to God. And so that's what I try to do, to be a, a missionary and ambassador of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's what my life is about, and helping people not get persecuted and tortured and having to get up and take their things and move a thousand miles to cross a border into a land they don't know. I, I just, it just really hurts me when I see all those things happening on the on the news. So when when we first met in Strasbourg and I mean you opened up this whole new field and it was amazing because you really premised it all in what is what are human rights? What is, how do you define it? How do you understand it? And really in the last 20 years since I've known you, we've seen this this shift within the international human rights field where you, at the time, I remember learning, we had the first generation of rights, second generation, third generation, and now you've got all these new categories of rights. Um, what, what, what is your perspective on where human rights have gone in the last 20 years of just expanding into so many new categories? And how is that, you know, have people kind of lost the, the understanding? Because you've written now three encyclopedias of human rights, you've, you've remained engaged in this field of human rights education, really trying to educate people about definitions and terminology and like, hey, there is a foundation. You don't just, you know, you're a lawyer, so you don't just change definitions as you go. You always want to go back to the original intent. How does, how does that, how have you seen that in the last two decades? Well, it has expanded as knowledge about these rights has increased, but there are people in different advocacy fields, for example, gay rights, that have tried to take what is there and expand it to meet what their vision of things should be like, or the communists, um, you know, or the, the atheists. They've all tried to take what is there and expand it and tweak it into something that is compatible with what they want. Or if that doesn't work, they create a brand new area. Tina talked about generations of rights. We had three generations. We had civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, and then what we call the third generation rights. Now, none of those rights are really human rights. They're kind of like aspirations. World peace, that was one human right. Um, the right to humanitarian intervention, meaning if we have a catastrophe in my country, we have a right to demand that every other country come in and help us out. So they created these areas. They were sort of aspirations, things that the governments wished to or the advocates wished to, to have happen that might have been nice, but they weren't really human rights. And human rights are individual rights. It's not the right of my state 
of the international community. It's my human right because I'm a human being. So it has changed over the last 20 years, and there have been some, some false and misleading claims of what is a human right, uh, which are really not human rights. For example, the right to same-sex marriage, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you as an expert, there is no human right to a same-sex marriage. There just is not. And that's been uh, uh, held in two cases, one in the UN level and one in the European level, that say there is no specific human right that says, I as a man can marry another man. It just is not there as a human right. But others have said that it is a human right. Well, I disagree with them. And that's what this field is like. We have, I think this and you think that, and we might debate and we'll write papers, we'll write books, and we'll try to convince the world of our particular perspective. Perhaps neither of us is right. Perhaps um, we're, we're half right each, uh, depending on what factors you put into that. So um, there are a lot of disputed things in the field of human rights. Uh, recently, we had a United States, we had a, a, a commission that looked at human rights to try to see what they really are uh, they, they, they had a conclusion. I don't want to get into that. It's, it's very political, but they saw human rights as a lot fewer than what the rest of the world is claiming are human rights. Uh, expanding human freedom is something we all want to do because we're living in a world where every society runs according to laws, which we call norms, the way governments are supposed to act the way people are supposed to act, the limits of how we act. And um, we there's a tendency to keep expanding those. And then they expand them to the point where if there's a problem, it creates chaos or destruction or confusion, where we, we pull back and we pass a law and we, we limit the activity so we can avoid that bad result. And so this keeps going on in our world. I mean, for example, uh, the the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations. We've seen the exercise of the right to peaceful assembly, and we've had the claim that some of the assemblies are not peaceful and therefore should not be allowed or should be limited, or that the use of certain force like pepper spray or tear gas is, is okay to use. So this discussion and this discourse, this battle, so to speak, legal political battle is going on every day. But there is a field of, of human rights law that is not being applied to that discussion. What, I, what I'm doing and part of my work is bringing that body of law into this discussion. Uh, for example, uh, one of the rights is the right to vote. Um, it's expressed in one of the treaties that the United States has ratified. And it says everyone who's a citizen has a right to vote. And there cannot be any unreasonable limitations or obstructions to the right to vote. Now, no one that I've heard so far has brought this issue up in our discussions uh, in our country today about limiting voting and the new uh, laws that are proposed to make voting secure. So um, one of the things I'm doing is trying to bring human rights into the American dis discourse, discussion about things like voting, about uh, same-sex marriage, about um, immigration, about how these international norms apply, should apply in the United States, according to my view as a Christian lawyer. So that's kind of what I do. But it, there has been movement in the international human rights law over the last 20 years to expand the meaning and to create new rights, some of which I can say are sub-rights implicit in a particular right, and some are just not rights at all. If I, if I said, okay, I'm proclaiming that there's a right to play soccer on the moon. I have a human right to play soccer on the moon. Now I could say that, and I could say, well, I'm a professor and I, I said there was, so there, there, are, there is no such right. I can't claim that, that's wrong. So there are some rights out there that are, are not really human rights that are claimed human rights. So we need to research, we need to look, we, that's why I write books, so you can go look in them and say, aha, that's not a human right, so now I know. So we educate ourselves, we learn about what is right, what isn't right, and we use whatever the basis of our beliefs are, our, our Bible, 
uh, whatever uh, theological and political books that we use, and we look at that and see how do I, what do I think about that? And my view, which I try to do as a lawyer, even as a Christian, is I try to present things so I'm not telling them what I think it should be as a Christian, but here's what I think as a lawyer this should be. I want to be objective. I want to let you decide how you see that based on where you're coming from. I don't want to tell you or criticize you so much as I want to help you to lead you to, sh to show you that the way you're seeing things is really not correct. But I want to do that by creating what some of us call, and this is a fancy word, cognitive dissonance. And that means that you look at something and you, you look at it and you go, that, that just isn't right. That just doesn't fit. That's, it's supposed to be this, but that just, something's wrong with that. That's called cognitive dissonance. So if someone is trying to propose something that I think is wrong, I will try to help them uh, have a cognitive dissonance moment to where we can now change their concept, the way they see this particular right or the rights of women or um, the rights of immigrants or the rights of uh, handicapped people. So that's what I try to do. At, and I'm fighting against those movements to expand human rights beyond what I think they should be. I believe in first generation human rights, civil and political rights, and religious freedom is in that body. These are kinds of rights, what they cover. These why, are about the, why is religious freedom as a right and the freedom of thought, conscience, belief, why is that such a critical human right in your opinion? Great question. <laughs> the first human right that existed in international law was freedom of religion. It happened back in the, uh, the early 20th century uh, when they were creating um, the mandates and, and, and they established uh, religion rules that everyone could practice their religion. It's important because one, it's the first human right. And the reason it was is because of two things. One, because religion was the source of conflict all the time. People were fighting over religion and whose religion were like. So to avoid conflict, they made rules about freedom of religion so there would not be conflict. The second one is, what is freedom of religion in human rights? What it is, it, it doesn't mean like going to church and lighting a candle or having a mass or a, 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 a Torah celebration or whatever, uh, a Jewish or a Muslim celebration. It means the orientation of an individual human being to the ultimate truth of reality. What I mean is the ability of the human being to figure out what is the truth about everything themselves. To, to, to look and see, what do I believe? Is, is the moon made of cheese? Is communism a good uh, ideology? Is capitalism a good philosophy? Is heterosexuality the only right religion or right, right way to, to be a sexual human being? All of these questions that we have it's about orienting ourselves to what's real, what's true to us. That's why religion is important, because if you can't do that, if you're prohibited from doing that, you won't be able to make any other human rights. So religious freedom is about you being able to believe and to do what you want uh, within limits and to decide what is a human right, what is not, and to affect your society by your voting by your political activity, by your writings, by your work, by your sharing with others about what you think is the right thing to do and the right way to be. So uh, religious freedom is the most important human rights. We call it the linchpin of all human rights. Because if you can't figure out what's right and what's wrong, you're not going to be able to figure out about human rights and what they are and what is a human right and what is not. So that's why it's so important. One, it's a source of conflict. It's also been the source of resolution of conflict very often when religion is done properly as a sort of intervening, uh, mediating, um, peace-bringing kind of, uh, of uh, mediator between warring parties. So it, it's been the cause of conflict so often, but it's also been the, the way of solution to problems too, okay? 
Well, and I mean, this freedom of conscience and of thought is essential to have that resolution, to be able to overcome those differences that we see in societies that really tear people apart. I mean, we like to say that, you know, people never came, never end up in conflict over things they agree on. It's things they disagree on. So protecting that freedom to disagree and to disagree peacefully and respectfully is really critical in any society that wants to be free. So one more thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One more thing that I forgot to mention. It's the most deepest part of our personal identity. Okay. So it's also important because I am a, I'm a Catholic. Okay. That's the deepest part of my identity and all the rest of my world revolves around that uh, and, and what I believe is a Catholic and so it's, it's, it's the deepest part of my personal identity, and that's why it's so important to people. It's like the last thing they want to lose. lose. They might be passionate about a soccer team, but they're probably more passionate about what they believe as a, a Jew, as a Muslim, as a Hindu. That's the deepest part of their identity. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's what we see around the world. So kind of going off that last point, Skip, you've joined us in many countries around the world to – to help with our trainings on teaching people that have very different views and beliefs, how to work together, how to um, develop laws that protect the rights of everyone. So I'd love for you to share just a little bit about what you've seen in some of those countries. And we can start with Nepal. You know, Nepal was a very interesting uh, trip for us because um, we were helping to train parliamentarians that well, actually, you were with me twice, once when I was pregnant in Nepal, and then again, right? So the first yeah. trip, you were, you know, we were training uh, some pastors and religious leaders there that were fighting for their rights. And then the second was with the parliamentarians that were really negotiating what those rights would be. What were some of the challenges that you saw in trying to get people in Nepal to protect the freedom of everyone. Why was that so difficult? And how did you well, see our training as, 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 as a way of helping them better understand how to, what, the why, why they should? Well, there, there's two different aspects to this. And I want to look at the uh, pastors first. I, 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 there's something about training the pastors. These were various Christian pastors in Nepal, which is a minority religion, which has been persecuted. And we were teaching them what their human rights were under international treaties that Nepal had ratified and was part of Nepal law. So these pastors, for the first time, learned what rights they did have, not rights they were fighting to get, but what rights they did have right then and there that they could assert, that they could talk to the government about, I have a right to freedom of religion. I have a right to freedom of expression. I have a right to freedom to, to bury my dead. Uh, so we taught the pastors their rights so they could, could, could use them with the government and say, I want my rights respected. Um, most of the government people don't know what these rights are, but certainly these pastors did not know until we told them. And so now when we teach people their rights, it does something to them. It empowers them. It makes them feel stronger. It's like, I'm not doing this just because I'm a Christian. I have a right as a Nepali citizen under Nepali's law to do this, to say this, to, to assert this, okay? So that's what the pastors, teaching them, giving them a tool that they could use in relation to the government to get the government to do something or not do something, to allow them to buy some land, to bury their dead, which they couldn't do, okay? Now, with regards to the parliamentarians, it's different. The parliamentarians are like the Congress people, like our congressmen and senators. They make the laws in Nepal, which had a revolution uh, back you know, 20 years ago and which, which um, uh, was in the process of making a new constitution and new laws. And the parliamentarians are the people who make the new laws. And they were in the process among other things, of making a new law that they were trying to pass that said, you are prohibited from sharing your religion with anybody else, period. And if you do that and you're caught, you'll, it'll cost you $300 in fine, and you could be in jail for three years just for sharing your religion with someone else. Now, the reason that came up was because 
um, a lot of missionaries came in from different religions, like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, and even Christian missionaries, also some Muslim uh, Muslims and and um, uh, some other religions came into Nepal and started to try to convert people. And the Hindu uh, religious leaders were very ups upset about that because they were they thought that they were losing their sheep, their people, to these other religions which they didn't accept. So the parliament in, in Nepal, and then Nepal is about, what, 90% uh, Hindu religion, um, some very, very religious, and some just kind of culturally Hindu, uh, mild, uh, moderate, mild Hindus, but Hindu nonetheless, it's part of their national identity for some of them. So we were training the parliamentarians about human rights, which none of them had heard about um, or most, none, almost all of them had never heard about human rights in international law or, or the treaties that their country had ratified. So here they are like members of Congress who didn't know what the law was in their own country. We were trying to get them to see that the law that they were going to pass that would prohibit them from sh anyone from sharing their religion was not consistent, was not in harmony with the international law that says everyone has the right to uh, manifest their religion, to have their religion, and to change their religion if they want to. That's the international law that Nepal had accepted. But no one knew about it. No one talked about it. But we talked about it. We told them, here is your right under your law. And as parliamentarians, you shouldn't be passing a law that violates the international law that you've accepted to follow. So we were creating with the parliamentarians, we're trying to create that cognitive dissonance with them, saying, here's what law you want to pass, really to protect Hinduism and that sort of national Hindu identity. And here's what the international law is that you accepted and ratified in international law and told the rest of the world you'd follow. So we're trying to create that cognitive dissonance to hope to see, to show these parliamentarians that what they're doing is inconsistent and really unjust. Well, the and problem and with that and about other... cha challenges, the challenges, all these parliamentarians came from different political parties, and the politics was what overrid their sense of international justice and human rights. Their loyalty to their party and the party's position was what they felt bound to follow and not this international law. So the dilemma was convincing them that it's more important to follow the international law for the whole country than that your party gets to pass a law that protects the Hindus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it was interesting in that context that they thought they could impose their point of view on everyone and pass a law to criminally punish anyone that tried to do that to them. Uh, and it was interesting to just dissect that and navigate it, but to build buy-in from them of why this is in their best interest, why they don't have to be afraid of people that have differences of belief in mm -hmm. their society. Uh, people that have an individual right to choose what they want to believe, believing something different than the status quo in society. There's there's often in every country this fear of, of people changing their beliefs or leaving and how that would upset the, the social structure. And, and that was a legitimate fear there and something that we were hopefully able to help them overcome a little bit. Uh, they did end up passing a constitution that for the most part recognized a, a generally secular country that allowed freedom for everyone. But these are still challenges there today because ultimately you've got to change the society and the fears that everybody in the society has. You have to change the culture, not just uh, one or two individuals to begin to see a shift towards greater freedom in society. So in Iraq, I think it's you know a similar situation of you have a majority that's in control. You have a lot of different minorities that are in the country and that have been severely persecuted. Uh, post the Iraq war and really post ISIS, we went in to help these minority groups better understand how can we navigate the challenges in society and begin to 
overcome uh, the, 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 the lack of access or power that we have to be able to even get our rights protected in the government. Can you tell me when you came to Iraq with us, what was your experience? What did you, what most impressed you about just the way that we were able to help in this very difficult situation, help Iraqis better understand their rights? Well, the first thing I want to say is when I was sitting there in, in Doe Hook, I was saying, I am 75 miles away from ISIS. ISIS, you know, the people that cut your head off? That's where I was. And I'm teaching human rights. I felt like I was teaching uh, navigation to the people on the deck of the Titanic. Um, what we want to, to do, because the people in Kurdistan wanted to have a Western style democracy with freedom and human rights, because they didn't want what was happening across there, over there where ISIS is, uh, imposing Sharia law on people and killing Christians and committing genocide. They wanted a freedom-based, democracy-based, human rights-based society that had what we call rule of law. And by the way, rule of law means law is the highest authority in the country. Uh, no individual, no ideology is higher than that. Of course, as Christians, we believe there is a higher law. Uh, it is God's law, divine law. We were training lawyers, teachers, journalists, newspaper and TV, and um, uh, pastors uh, who were leaders in this area in Kurdistan, and we were teaching them, again, what human rights are, particularly freedom of religion. But we were also trying to get them to accept each other and to recognize the human dignity of each other. We had Muslims in this group. They were moderate Muslims. We had all the religions in Iraq there in this group, the Baha'is, the Yazidis, uh, several others too. And, and, and we had, um, there were different kinds of, of Muslims too. We have Sh Sunni and Shia, uh, mostly Sunnis in, in, in Iraq. Um, but we had all of the different religions and all the different professions that, that were important and as changes of society. And we taught them human rights, the basics, but also we focused on freedom of religion. We gave them a lot of exercises to do that helped bring them to that cognitive dissonance and open their eyes to the fact that there is a set of laws, international laws, that their country in Iraq has accepted, has ratified, and has told the world, we will do it this way. And so we're telling these people again, like we did in Nepal, here are the rights that you have now under international law. So use them in relation to your government and in creating a new government in your schools, in your media, uh, outlets, in your legal systems, for lawyers, for judges, for uh, law students, for, for law school, for poli-sci teachers, for pol political science, for police chiefs, for military leaders. Put human rights into your system. Um, so we're trying to help the Kurdish people who want to make their own country called Kurdistan and who are in the process of doing that. They're building their institutions, their political infrastructure. And so they wanted um, a legal system of human rights to protect the individual from ever going back to the way it was when ISIS was in control. Because they'd been liberated, thanks to the Americans, and they didn't want to go back to that ISIS type of a si situation, extreme Islamic um, ideology, extremism. So they were very concerned and very open to learning about human rights. And when you teach human rights, it does something inside of the individual. It, it, it rings true. It, 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 it feels right when you listen to it because it tells you who you are. It tells you first and foremost about your human dignity. And that's the basis of all human rights, your human dignity. Now, what does human dignity mean? It means your worth, your value, your inherent human value as a human being, and every human being on the face of the earth has the same inherent human dignity. And on that human dignity is based all of the human rights that I teach about. So we're teaching these lawyers, teachers, we had lady teachers with their, their hijabs on and their, their um, these are 
Muslim people, we weren't telling anyone to become Christians. We weren't telling them to be anything but what they wanted to be, but to be free to do that and to let each other, other religions, other peoples be that free. And so by the end of this, this teaching session, we had Muslims that were standing up for Yazidis, and we had, Jeho we had Jehovah's Witnesses that were standing up for Baha'is, and we had Christians uh, standing up for Muslims. We, we had, it, it created a, just like a brotherhood and sisterhood among these people who now saw themselves not as, I'm a Muslim, you're a Christian, but as, you're a human being, I'm a human being, you have these rights, you have this dignity, I respect that, I will fight for your human rights if someone tries to, to stop that. So we had all these exercises, all this training for a whole week, and it changed these people profoundly. Even the, the Muslims uh, who are in the group who tend to be very defensive of Islam um, in the beginning, but who, well, I want to say mellowed out, but, but, but changed in their perception of the other. And one of the people said in that talk, they said, he said, this is the first time I've ever been in a place where I can talk to any of these people in these other groups. Imagine that. This is the first time I've ever been able to talk to a Muslim or a Yazidi or a Christian or a, a Jew or a Baha'i. So we created the forum in which they could see each other as people. We brought to them a set of values that had been transformed into international law for governments to follow called human rights law. And we're trying to get them to bring that body of law into their society that they're creating at that time. I'm sure they've done more of this after we've left, but that was a start. And we established a framework for human rights protection in Kurdistan, which they will use. And they will also be able to assert it in relation to the Iraqi government itself, which considers Kurdistan part of Iraq and uh, which doesn't really want them to become their own country, uh, mostly because of where the oil lies <laughs> under Kurdistan, uh, though they don't have the refineries to refine it. But anyway, we were there to help a conflict area that had been highly conflicted because of the divisions with all these different groups, where in fact, genocide was being committed. Genocide, like the worst crime, the worst human rights violation of all, was happening there. And we were there after that was stopped and, and, and trying to put in place a system that would make sure it didn't happen again, never again. Okay? Well, it's, it's so important. And, and I think similar to that was the work that we did in Nigeria. And um, Nigeria is, is, is a different situation altogether to, you know, going from Nepal, which is predominantly Hindu, Iraq, which is predominantly Muslim, and dealing with the issues of navigating minority rights in both, to Nigeria, which is in many ways um, pretty similar numbers of both Muslims and Christians in the country and a lot of indigenous people as well, and, and yet very divided along those two lines. And so Hardwired went into northern Nigeria, uh, into the 20 northern states, which included the capital, and began to work with both Muslim and Christian legal teams throughout the North together uh, to bring them together for the first time in understanding what their rights are, how to respect one another's rights, and how to work together. And that had never been done. So when you, when you saw the work that we were doing in Nigeria, how did that make you think about the situation there and the opportunities there? And, you know, Nigeria has been a source of so much conflict in, in Africa. Like, what, did, what was your experience there? What did you think about that? Well, it gave me some hope that things can change in Nigeria because when I saw a Muslim lawyer and a team with a Christian lawyer and they were working together to bring religious freedom to all religions, the Muslim lawyer wanted freedom of religion for the Christians too. When I saw that they were willing to work, I realized there are good people in Nigeria who do want to make Nigeria better that do want to overcome these divisions and these discriminations that are happening and will work together. So I was really blown away because every team chose a particular project for their their state, their state, and they, they're going to work on a legal project, which would have hopefully some concrete change when they go back to their state and they can change this law 
or go to court and get the court to protect this church or this religion or get back some property that was taken by another uh, group. Uh, it, it, it gave me hope that there are people that want to make the country better and that can work together and can cross over the boundary between religions. Because when religions are divided, when people say, hate that other religion, hate them, they're horrible, they're the devil, then you have conflict, you have division, society is, 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 is fractured. But when you work together like this, especially in lawyers, it, it really is a, a model for other people within their state, but also gives us hope that they can go back to those states and transmit what we taught them about human rights, about religious freedom, and that they can be purveyors, they can be carriers and ambassadors of religious freedom to their state when they go back. So it was really amazing working with all of these teams. And there were a few girls, there were a few lady lawyers among them. And I was really impressed with the lady lawyers. I mean, being it's a society where you know men kind of do most stuff, but there are some lady lawyers that 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 really have their their act together and they really are, are not afraid to work line shoulder to shoulder with men and, and 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 also are concerned about freedom of religion. So we taught them about what the human rights were, about religious freedom, what it says. Uh, we talked about how you can take human rights law and put it into your society. We looked at the law in each of the states. We had a list of each state, 20 states, and each state we had what laws that are a problem that are discriminatory against a certain religion and, and, and how can we solve that. Um, and then the group, the team of two, two lawyers, a Muslim and a Christian, they would create a project. Okay, we're going to go back. We're going to write a draft law that changes this particular discriminatory law. Okay, and we're going to propose this law to see if we can get it changed and make this this law uh, make our society more non-discriminatory. So that's what we were trying to do. It was different projects for different states. Some, again, it was changing a law. Some, it was going to court to get uh, some... Um, an injunction against the government doing it, trying to tear down a church or something like that. Uh, so different projects. As we wrap up, because we, it's been great to talk about the impact. You often go and talk to a lot of different groups, Skip, about our work. And I would yeah. love for you to just share, you know, what is it that inspires you to work with us all over the world in these different countries? Why, why hardwired? I mean, you've worked with so many different groups. You have so much experience. And I mean, the expertise, why do you, why do you spend time hanging out with us, you know, all over the world? <laughs> well, when I see how you, Tina, are motivated and what your vision is, I, that blesses me. It's like, you're, you're my, my academic child. And I see what I've been trying to create in the world, which I wish I could have done. I see you doing it. And I want to be part of that vision because it's been part of my vision even before I taught you, but also... I just hate seeing human beings abused by governments and by other people. And, and I want to make it better. I want people to live in peace and harmony and religious freedom. So uh, it's that, and it's also God's calling on my life. He wants me to stand up for people's legal protection and human rights. So uh, that's kind of what motivates me. And, and uh, hardwired, what I see in hardwired, I've seen the results. I've seen the concrete results of their work. It is a, a perfect and incredible blend of human rights knowledge and knowledge of education, education methods, education pedagogy, you know, how you teach, uh, the exercises that come up between Tina and her mother, who has a doctor of education degree, mixing those with the knowledge of human rights. It is something the world needs now to create more tolerant, more open individuals that will that will uh, limit uh, the conflict in our society. And finally, in closing, studies have shown us that countries that have more religious freedom are more economically prosperous. So to have religious freedom in a country is good for the economy of a country. It makes the economy grow because society is more stable. So this is what we'd like to do, create stable society where there's religious freedom and where there's religious freedom, there will be more economic opportunity, more economic development, and everyone will prosper physically, psychologically, 
economically in every way. So that's what we want to do. It's good for the world. Thank you, Skip. Well, is there any last like story or thing that you remember like the last couple of minutes that you, you think that we should have, that you would have liked to have shared about your experience with us? Is there any one thing that may have happened that? that, um, that well, the, the one thing that happened was I was going from Doha to, uh, to Erbil and our car broke down and we stopped by the side of the road and I was sitting there and uh, my bodyguard said, you see right over there, that hill over there? That's where ISIS is. And it's like, I, I had a moment in time where I'm saying, those are the guys that I saw on television cutting people's heads off. And that's kind of scary, but God, I'm glad you're here protecting me. So it was a, it was a moment where the reality of what we're doing sometimes gets dangerous. And, and, and our going into countries, sometimes we're in a little bit of risk too either by some fanatical religious people or maybe sometimes even by the government that doesn't like us coming in because they're afraid we'll be converting people to another religion. So it's not a, a completely safe activity that we do, but we do it because it's right and it's good. So that's one thing that happened that made me realize that there's a cost to doing this. Sometimes you're in dangerous situations, but it was certainly well worth the risk. But the, the changes I've seen in the people that I talk to still you, you see that we did make a difference in their lives. They're so grateful they learned things that they'd never learned before, even as lawyers. And when you tell a lawyer something that he doesn't even know about his own country's law, that's, that's kind of a nice, fun thing to do. And as lawyers, we love talking law and comparing our different legal systems. I really enjoy that. Thank you, Tina. Well, Skip, thank you.